I decided to make a short video to explain a very weird concept, complex angles, that arises in electromagnetics and photonics. I've seen this question asked in online forums, and I read the answers, and I really didn't like any of the answers. I think the big thing this is missing is the visual. There's a very nice picture of what a complex angle is trying to represent. Suppose we have a plane wave in some medium. It's just an ordinary lossless medium right now. So we see the wave just sort of trucking along. We can write an expression for that wave. So the overall electric field we write as E, it has some amplitude and polarization. It turns out this won't be very important for our discussion, so we will essentially ignore this. The magic is really in this exponential term. We are restricting our wave to be in the XZ plane, and that's really not going to change anything about the meaning of what a complex angle is. We're using the negative sign convention, so we're expressing our wave as negative J, J being the square root of negative one, times the free space wave number, times the refractive index, times this expression in parentheses, and the angle of this wave relative to the normal is theta. So the angle between the normal and this, the direction of our wave is theta. If we examine this a little bit more closely, we can look at a plane that is perpendicular to the direction of the wave, and we can observe that the, in this plane, the phase of the wave is constant, and also its amplitude is constant. Very often we'll call these the phase fronts are aligned with that plane. We can also look at a plane in the direction of the wave, and since the wave is not decaying, that is also uniform. Now suppose this medium has loss. Our wave decays. We can clearly see it's nice and bright at the left, and it decays as it propagates. When we introduce loss, the refractive index becomes a complex quantity. So let's go ahead and write it that way. The real part of complex refractive index is called the ordinary refractive index. And this is typically the number that we actually use when we talk about refractive index. The imaginary part is called the extinction coefficient. And the negative is in here because we're using the negative sign convention. So positive values of kappa here will represent loss. Let's go ahead and expand that exponential. And then we can split it into two different exponentials. Inside the first exponential is a minus j. So this is a complex exponential, and this is describing phase of the wave. The other exponential does not have j, and it's describing decay of the wave. We can see that the ordinary part of refractive index is what's describing the phase of a wave. It's how quickly the wave accumulates phase as it propagates, or we can think of this as how quickly it oscillates in the direction of propagation. The second exponential describing decay has the extinction coefficient. So the extinction coefficient is describing how quickly this wave decays. Even though we have incorporated loss, this plane of equal amplitude and plane of equal phase is the same. However, if we look in the direction of propagation, we can see that the amplitude is decaying exponentially. That is no surprise. Now let's introduce a second medium. So the wave we've been talking about is incident onto an interface and produces a transmitted wave. Both of these mediums, medium one and medium two, are called semi-infinite half spaces. That means they extend off to infinity in the x direction, also the y direction. They extend off into infinity in one of the z directions, but of course they end here, and that's the semi-infinite part. But the medium one in the negative z direction goes off to infinity, 
and medium two in the positive z direction extends off to infinity. I've chosen medium two to have a higher refractive index. So the wave in the second medium is propagating more slowly and the wavelength is smaller because of that. However, boundary conditions requires that the field match on both sides of the interface. This is why the wave is bending. There's a different wavelength on both sides of the interface, yet it's required to match at the interface. And the only way to do that is to tilt the angle of one of the waves relative to the other so that the field matches across the interface. So that's why refraction happens. At this point, we can write expressions for both of these waves. And we're borrowing the same expression that we had before. The only difference here is in medium one, we have this subscript one on refractive index to remind us this is the refractive index of the incident medium. And theta one, that's the angle of incidence. And we can write essentially the same expression for medium two, but now we have a subscript two telling us these are the properties, the parameters associated with medium two. If we look at this a little bit deeper, we can look at the amplitude in a direction parallel to the interface. And what we see is that the amplitude is constant for both of these waves. And that's because there's no decay at this point. So it makes sense. The amplitudes on both sides of the interface have to match. It's continuous across the interface. Now let's add loss in the second medium. And this is where things begin to change pretty dramatically. So we've added loss. So the wave in the second medium decays. And if we borrow what we talked about before, we'll have a wave that's decaying in the direction that the wave is propagating. However, that creates a problem that we can already start to see. Notice over at the left side of the interface, the field has essentially the same brightness on both sides of the interface. But over here, we see a bright wave above the interface and a dim wave below. The amplitude is not matching across the interface. So something is wrong with this picture as we've described it, and we have to change something to fix this. We can get a little bit more mathematical here and plot the amplitudes of both of these waves on either side of the interface. Well, we didn't put loss in medium one, so we still have a uniform amplitude in medium one. However, in the second medium, the amplitude is decaying. So as we go from left to right, the amplitude is changing. And this can't be boundary conditions requires that the field look the same on both sides of the interface. So we have to fix this. The incident wave is what it is. There's nothing about the second medium that can change what the incident wave looks like. And we know that the incident wave in the direction parallel to the interface has a uniform amplitude. Therefore, boundary conditions requires that the amplitude in the second medium also be uniform in the direction parallel to the interface. However, that second medium has loss. This requires that the, the amplitude decay in some way, so the only direction that it can decay is in the direction away from the interface. Well, we still have phase here, and we still have some kind of wave fronts happening in a direction perpendicular to the direction that the wave is propagating. But this now is only the plane of constant phase. This is no longer the plane of constant amplitude. Plane of constant amplitude in this case is parallel to the interface. So our plane of constant phase and our plane of constant amplitude have become misaligned. And it turns out the equation that we're using to describe the wave no longer works. We have to fix something in order to describe this wave. One way to fix the equation is to let the angle in the second medium B 
be a complex quantity. That's crazy. An angle being a complex number. We need to figure out what's going on here. So first, let's write the real and imaginary parts explicitly. Refractive index is a complex number. And since we want to write the real and imaginary parts explicitly, we need to bring that into the parentheses so that it's multiplying the sine and cosine functions. From there, we will separate the real and imaginary parts, write them explicitly. So multiplying the x, we have the real part of the product of n2 times sine theta 2 plus j times the imaginary part of n2 times sine theta 2. And likewise, the function that was multiplying z is the real part of n2 times cosine theta 2 plus j times the imaginary part of n2 times cosine theta 2. The next thing we'll do is group the phase and amplitude terms together. So the phase terms is everything in this equation that's being multiplied by j, and the amplitude terms is everything that's not being multiplied by j. So to do that, we essentially just multiply out everything inside this exponential, expand it, and collect terms. And we have a group of terms that's all being multiplied by this j, which we have pulled out to the front, and then there's everything else that's not being multiplied by j. That puts this in a convenient form that we can split the exponential. We have two exponentials now. This first one, everything's being multiplied by j. So this is describing the phase of the wave. The second exponential does not have a j in it. So this is describing the amplitude. So having a complex angle allows us to describe the phase fronts of a wave and the amplitude fronts of a wave differently and separately. A great question to ask at this point is, so what are the angles of the planes of constant amplitude and planes of constant phase because we now have a complex refractive index multiplying our complex angles and things are a little bit confusing. Well, it turns out waves propagate in a way that the arguments of the exponentials are a constant and we're free to choose a constant in this context here. So let's look at the phase fronts. So we'll go to the exponential that's describing phase We'll grab the argument and set it equal to a constant, and we end up here. Now we see we have an expression multiplying the x-coordinate and an expression multiplying the z-coordinate. This is what lets us determine the angle. So the angle of our phase fronts then is the inverse tangent of the expression multiplying our x-coordinate divided by the expression multiplying our z-coordinate. That gives us the angle of our planes of constant phase. Similarly, if we want to know the angle of the amplitude fronts, we would go to the exponential describing the amplitude. We would take the argument of that exponential, set that equal to a constant, and now we just take the expression multiplying the x, the expression multiplying by z, put that into our inverse tangent, and we can calculate the angle of our amplitude fronts. So it's not that the real and imaginary parts, we can't say the real part is the angle of the phase fronts and the imaginary part is the angle of the amplitude fronts. We can't say that because it's getting mixed with the refractive index, but we have nice equations here to calculate those angles. So the big conclusion here is that a complex angle is used to describe a wave where the plane of constant phase is not aligned with the plane of constant amplitude. We saw that one way this can arise is at the interface of two materials where there's loss. You can imagine this getting even more complicated. Suppose there was a medium above medium one. Now the incident wave on this second medium might itself be, have a complex angle. And so it can get very complicated, but that's what complex angles are describing. I wanna thank you very much for watching this video. And if you like this content, you like this visual way of learning, 
Check out everything that we offer on EMPossible.net. And if you like this video, you found it helpful, it really helps me out if you click the like button and subscribe to this channel.